Professor Annis. Can doing away with the dead donor rule allow us to keep more people who are on waiting lists from dying, or at least some of them, and, and have access to organs if you follow something like what uh, Dr. Trug is suggesting? Bob said, well, they're going to die soon anyway. Uh, maybe, but that doesn't mean we could go in and shoot them, for example, to take a, a pretty gross analogy. That would still be murder. Right? The question is whether they're alive now, and then the next question is what are their interests? Bob would argue they have no interest in their organs. Well, I think a lot of people would contest that. A lot of people think just keeping their baby alive another day is important. Uh, and we did have this case years ago, the anencephalic baby. I mean, that's even a, a just a better case, if you'd say, the baby never had a brain, never will have a brain, has zero chance to survive, has a brain stem, which is why its heart is still beating. Uh, but we had couples, one famous couple in Florida, uh, went to court saying that they demanded the right to donate the organs from their anencephalic uh, newborn. And the court said, no, it's not dead. If you want to do that, that's fine, but you have to change the definition of death to include Babies born without any a higher brain, just a brain stem. No state did that. You could do that, uh, but we have never changed the definition of death. I think that Bob's wrong to think that we're playing around the margins of death. The definition, since the adoption of the brain death definition as an alternative to circulatory and uh, respiratory function, has never been changed. The question we're debating is whether it should be changed, and I think it. it uh, I think it's very dangerous to change it. The whole area of organ donation relies on the public trusting physicians in that they believe they won't murder them or commit homicide, they won't hasten their deaths. We ought not uh, underestimate public unease. Uh, I, I was in a room uh, last night of people and asked them how many had donor cords and then I asked the ones who said they didn't and it was not the majority but it was a significant minority, why not? And it's because they feared that they might have their lives shortened and I think they were thinking about quality life, but nonetheless, the fear was there that they might be shuffled away too soon because a celebrity or a rich person or someone who could pay more for these operations would get it. So that worry is out there, making people wonder if you're going to cut corners on their care in order to salvage organs from them uh, is a very dangerous area to be in. We might be able to do this if we can find what we're talking about in newborns start to take that into the adult population, I worry you're going to lose organs. You know, I think uh, having practiced critical care medicine now for 20 years, I think um, the strong concern that physicians may give up too early, that I, I might not get all the resources I need, is something that we have lived with now for decades. You know, 30 years ago, uh, physicians were not willing to withdraw ventilators from patients in the ICU because they felt that in doing so, they would be killing the patient. Yeah. Um, today, we recognize that respecting the wishes of the patient and family is more important than those concerns about killing. And in that way, I think that the discussion we're having now isn't really new. So I am arguing that the decision is not based upon the irreversibility of cardiac function. Mm -hmm. That is the ethical justification is consent and prognosis. So it seems to me there the difficulty in bringing this forward to the public is going to have to be do you have the rock solid evidence to be sure that the prognosis you are making is error free? 60 to 90 percent of deaths in the ICU follow the withdrawal of life-sustaining treatment where doctors and families get together and they say what do you think the prognosis is here? And then we We'll decide in those cases where we think it's not good enough to take away the ventilator and we'll start to give morphine so that if there was a chance that the person was going to breathe, they're probably not going to breathe after they've gotten a fair amount of morphine yeah. and that patient dies amidst great uncertainty as yeah. to whether they might actually have been able to survive the ICU admission or not. This is daily life yeah. in the ICU. Yeah. What we're talking about with these small number of organ donors is a very small part of the spectrum way off at one end where no, the uncertainty does not go to zero, but it's at the edge of what we're dealing with mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. The new thing is that there's now this conflict of interest and in that when we're just withdrawing in the ICU without the option of organ donation, 
the only interest is the well-being of the patient, correct. and presumably we're doing it for that. And, and that's absolutely correct. We've now put this, a conflict of interest in, in that there's going to be organs coming out for the benefit of another, and that does introduce complexity. But I think that the, what we're looking for here is a little bit of national standard setting. Um, could we not get a kind of equivalent of the Harvard Brain Death Committee? Not far from where we sat in 1968, the criteria and definition, totally reversible loss of all brain function, the criteria to establish it were laid out by a blue ribbon panel that had national standing. You could uh, certainly expand that these days, I think, to take testimony or have people come and talk about uh, their views on this. But having an ethics committee do it locally, and I, I hate to put it this way, but I'm going to, I think there's even some conflict of interest when ethics committees of children's hospitals that do transplants want to sort of set the standards on what the donors are. Well, it's a curious place to come to, though, isn't it? We, we, the, that a community-based decision would not be acceptable, but a Harvard committee <laughs> <laughs> would be acceptable. Uh, I think the real test was that the Harvard committee had to be approved by the public Correct. because each Correct. state had to go Put one by one to, to change their laws. And when they changed their laws, it made transplantation possible. Were they wrong in Denver to have pushed here against the limits of our definitions? Uh, did they actually cross the line to violate law here? But the law has always been, you're dead when the doctor says you're dead, as long as he makes that decision following good and accepted medical practice. It appears, at least, that the, the coroner was right there in the room. The coroner does have have the authority uh, to make sure somebody's dead. So I don't think it's a legal question in that sense, but it's uh, certainly a heavy-duty ethical question and a, and a big medical practice question. Bob and Art, do you feel that they were within bounds to have gone ahead with this protocol without seeking more than their own uh, community consensus? We know that if they said, we're not going to do this until there's a national panel and we get approval, that it's never going to happen. Okay. And the way change happens in medicine is somebody goes out and does it. And I think um, uh, to that, I have no objections at all. And I think they've, uh, they've done us a service by bringing the issue forward. I think in cardiac death pronouncement, like I was suggesting even with adults and resuscitation measures, there is a kind of collective decision. There's some sense of uh, professional judgment coming in that, that the effort has to be suspended may not be effectively understood by the public, but that's why I'm not quite sure that we can't sell this as they are dead, as pronounced relative to some set of criteria without modifying the dead donor rule. Out of the discussion what comes is a, a glimmer of the possibility of public consensus, um, some clear wish for some stronger scientific evidence, however it could be gotten, to understand when you can bring people back uh, and when you can't when they're that sick. Um, and also a very provocative set of concerns that our dead donor rule uh, still is imperfect. I think these are very clearly crucially important questions about the precise limits that we in medicine must abide by. And so I want to thank our three panelists, um, Arthur Kaplan of the University of Pennsylvania, Robert Trug of Harvard Medical School, George Annis of the Boston University School of Public Health. For the New England Journal of Medicine, I am Atul Gawande.